and gentlemen, as they say, at all good dinners and events. And here we are in the most uneventful summer of all. Uh, but at least we have cricket on. Welcome again to a Black Opal webinar in association with our great friends, the Lords Taverns. And if you look at the lineup tonight, well, we're one short already. Lydia Greenway apologises. She apparently is working for something called Sky. Uh, it rings a vague bell in my mind. But um, anyway, she has things to do, so sadly Lydia will not be with us tonight. But the really, really good news is we have with us, as ever, Gladstone Small. Gladys is there representing England, Barbados, the West Indies. Anyone, any particular flag he wants to fly, he'll tell us about later. And, of course, my great mate. I mean, I once said, having picked a tour of India, or a team to go to India in 1984-85, when Christopher Cowdery was the last man on the list, I said, if you can't pick your mates, who can you pick? So here he is tonight, Christopher. <laughs> a very warm welcome to your first Black Opal social. Uh, how are you doing? I'm, I'm in peak form, actually, peak condition. Uh, I've lost a bit of weight, uh, lost a bit, lost a gallbladder. Um, <laughs> uh, is there uh, a search party out for it? Well, no, I, funny enough, I saw my surgeon this morning who stole it from me um, some weeks ago. And I said, look, I'm, I'm doing this show for Black Opal um, tonight and I would love to hold this uh, gallbladder up in the jar just to see whether people, what people thought of it. But he, he said he'd sent it off somewhere and that was it. It couldn't have it. Was it one of those sort of typical things that they do in hospitals? They say, look, don't worry, everything will be fine. Just put you to sleep for a while and you'll wake up exactly as you were before. And then, yeah, a couple of hours later, you're coming around again and someone said, oh, by the way, very, very sorry about this, but um, we thought we found a better use for your gallbladder. Uh, something like that, was it? Well, yes, I wonder whether it will be used. Maybe Gladstone could have it as a sort of transplant. If, you know, if you fancied a good, another gallbladder. Hmm. Now, my gallbladder is in perfect working order. I'll have, you know, <laughs> Mr. Cowdery. <laughs> You can, you can donate your body organs to, out of, to medical science for other purposes. Mm. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think we ought to apologise to our Black Opal audience who, normally speaking, you know, tune in at this time for a bit of cricket, a bit of travel, a bit of optimism about the world at large. And uh, I'm sorry we've already ruined it with uh, the medical bulletins relating to the great man himself, C.S. Cowdery, the Honourable, Honourable C.S. Cowdery. Uh, let's talk about a bit, a bit of cricket then, um, because... The very good news for all of us was that, must have been all of last week, we actually had cricket on our screen. Sky did a great job uh, broadcasting uh, a game without an audience. Um, there was commentary, there was a little bit of sound, there was action. Uh, and in the end, there was what I'd call a really good test match, where on the final day, we had all opportunities there in front of us. Um, it could have gone either way. Um, I have to say congratulations to the West Indies, because on, on two counts, which have been well well documented over the last few weeks. Anyway, first of all, for being here in the first place, which is a magnificent effort. Uh, but secondly, of course, for producing a number of very good individual performances, a great team performance that allows them to be one nil up with two to play. Um, Chris, what was your sort of feeling about that test match? Well, I love Jason Holder. I have to say that I think he is, he's an inspirational character. And I think you could see the West Indies really got behind him and, uh, He's one of those captains, a bit unlike us, really, you know, do as I do, do as I say, do, he does it all. Um, <laughs> but I, I, do you know, I, I don't want to harp on about the toss because my second favourite player in the world after Jason Holder is Ben Stokes. Like everybody, he's, he's an awesome cricketer and a lovely, lovely bloke. Um, but I do not understand when you turn up at a game of cricket and you see it overcast, the pitch is damp, it hasn't been used all season, of course, because there's been no cricket. Everything suggested that with the sunny climbs coming in the next few days, that it had to be a bold day. But these days, England, just like Australia, when they used to pitch up and push their chest out, we don't care what the pitch looks like, we don't care about the weather, we'll get runs against you, whatever it's like, we'll bat. And, and, you know, the old days, Colin Cowdery era and all that. That's right. Um, Are you related? Oh, yes. Good point. No, he, yeah, he, yeah. Played, he didn't play as much as me, but there we are. <laughs> but he was a big one for the old, you know, have a look at the pitch, look at the opposition, look at the clouds, and then bat. And odd people have followed that for years and years and years. I would have been the opposite. I would have definitely bowled because I think West Indies gave West Indies their only chance, in my view, of winning the game. And they, they did brilliantly. Indeed. I mean, there, there is an argument which says that despite all that, and what you say, you know, is very feasible, makes a lot of sense. But despite all that, had England batted better, which 
okay, bit of rustiness maybe in certain quarters. Um, but you know, if you'd put say 250 on the board instead of 200, uh, or even the 300 that you would anticipate when you do opt to bat first, then you're in a different position. Yeah, if they've made 300, but I mean, mm. if's a big word when you're taking mm. the chance. My, my view is you're taking a chance under those clouds. You could have been 20 for four and the game's over. And you may think it's a bit negative me. I was always a bold first man because I just felt that you can, you know, if you bat badly, you can lose the game in the first two hours. Mm. If you bowl badly, you don't actually lose the game. You're still mm. in the right. game. Okay, let's, Gladys, glad. as a man born in Barbados, as a man who's represented yeah, many teams around the world, um, where was your heart during that first test match? <laughs> well, I'll just say I couldn't lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, you've used that line before, I'm sure. But the caveat to that is, yeah. I, mean, of all, I mean, of all the teams where England play, and, and listen, they all, as we know, every team that we play, they all tend to play that 15, 20% even above what, what, wherever, wherever they're rated or ranked in the world, they want to be, beat England, that's for sure. And, and, and we know that as, as ex-England players. Mm -hmm. But uh, all I will say about that one is losing to the West Indies doesn't hurt as much as if we, lo if, as if we lose to Australia or India or, or the other country. So, so from that perspective, uh, yes. Uh, but listen, uh, if, when, if when it's come to cricket, it's, it's England. When it comes to to being in the sunshine, drinking beers and rum and that, and mm -hmm. what it's that's the Barbados. But going back to the toss, I mean, it is a it is a, the common thread these days, common theme that captains are, are scared about when they win the toss about about batting about, about bowling first. Um, and you you always you know the, the, to win a Test match, first class game cricket, you've got to take twenty wickets. So you've got to think how what's my best what's my best option taking 20 wickets and as, as Cal just 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 explained I mean you look at the conditions you know the, the, the weather the weather was always going to improve um, through through the weekend mm -hmm. but yet the same to the thinking behind batting first was because the pitch was going to be was going to deteriorate towards the end of the game surely surely you should be thinking of how how, how best are we going to get into the game, get in the winning position. And for me, that was the ball yeah. for I mean, the interesting thing to me is, right, you've got Ben Stokes, uh, first time in charge of an England team in a test match. You've got the usual management around you. You've got, you know, the, the coaches, you've got the senior players. It's not, I mean, it might well have been his, well, it always is, I guess, the final call for the captain. But in the meantime, that morning, he'll have talked to Jimmy Anderson, who might have fancied, you know, getting back into the swing of things, pardon the pun, straight away in those conditions. He'll have talked to the bowlers. He'll have sort of put feelers out around the team. So you've got to assume, um, I think, that there was a certain consensus about this, that it wasn't just Ben saying, sod it, we're going to bat. But strangely enough, um, I think Jimmy actually, you know, in that they had the, where the players were interviewed mm. in, their, in, their, in, the, in their, um, their little box, that they obviously social distancing. And Jimmy was the first person that they interviewed, John Commentary. And the question was put to him, was he consulted? Was he, was he, was he consulted about the, whether, to, whether to, he wanted to, to toss, what we were going to do? And he, and he said no. So here you are, you've got the guy who's taking the England's, our, our, our highest wicket taker, the guy who hoops it around corners, you know, with the juke ball, and in conditions that would have, he would have been busting. You know, he hasn't played cricket for... For, I don't know for, for for since the first Test match in South Africa at Centurion back in back in December, so he would have been busting the gut to get that ball in his hand mm. last, you know, that first that first morning, and he wasn't even out. So that that doesn't sit well with me, to be honest. That you know that in that situation, surely you go to your bowlers and say to a right guys. Yeah, you would have done. I mean, you right. you captain the team. You, you would have asked I, your, your bowlers what you what you what you want I mean, to do. I, 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 yeah, I agree. I would would like to get an opinion from those that might be bowling. Um, I might ignore it, <laughs> <laughs> as you often did. You would have, as, yeah. as, as Chris will tell you. 
<laughs> we'll get on to that one. As, as my strike bowler in India in 1984-85, he, he will tell you exactly what I think about bowlers. Um, <laughs> the only fit one then. <laughs> Sorry. Was he, only, was, he the only, was he the only fit bowler you had available? <laughs> no, I wouldn't call, wouldn't call him fit. Um, thank, you, thank you for calling me a bowler, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's just stick on the subject of tosses. Um, because, again, Christopher Cowdery, who once captained England, as the line goes, <laughs> um, the story of the toss at Headingley in 1988 against the West Indies with your opposite number, Viv Richards, has been doing the rounds a bit for various reasons. It seems to have hit social media in the last couple of weeks or maybe a month or so. Um, now, I've heard you tell this story um, on stage at dinners, and it's a, it's a funny story. Um, just, just first of all, can you just give us the truth of it? Because, as I say, these things get embellished and, you know, the Chinese whispers thing, you know, by the time it finishes up on social media, there appear to be a lot of extra elements that um, basically aren't true. So you give us the, you give us the truth. Well, for a start, yes, it's been em embellished. And mm -hmm. every time I go on Twitter or Instagram, whatever, it's, there's a new story, there's a bit been added. And I'm thinking, gosh, I wish I'd said that. It sounds a lot better. <laughs> when yeah, they've you're, added you're giving a lot of free material for, you know, for free. But, new material exactly. for free, as and when you get back to doing dinners again. Exactly. But I'm and a little bit nick, disappointed. And I'll be nicking your lines like I always do for my dinners, too. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Um, Yes, that reminds me, you owe me some... I do, sorry. It's yeah. in the post. It's um, in but listen, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit cross about it from Viv's point of view, because when I started this thing, it was, it was all good fun, slightly embellished, but it was based on the truth, based on what happened when I walked out there to toss with Viv. And now for, it, it's become a new story. I, apparently, I said that um, he walked out there in his surfing shorts for the toss, his, his flip-flops and a Bob Marley t-shirt. Well, that I never said. And, and, and the other one was when he got to number four of it, I got to number four of reading out my team, which was probably you. And he yeah. said, uh, that, that'll do man. Whoever you mention won't make any difference. Now, I never, he never said that. So the story has been exaggerated, but I'm, I'm flattered that people actually enjoyed the story. But the, the truth is very simple, that there I am standing in the middle of Headingley, a Kent captain, never played in England before, and I'm all dressed up for the toss, and I'm being abused by the home crowd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when the great man, who was easily my favourite player, apart from you, obviously, my yeah. favourite player that ever played the game, the great Viv, I mean, hairs on the back of the neck when he walked out down those white st steps there at Headingley and out onto the pitch. And he was given a standing ovation all the way to the middle. And I'm still being abused by the home crowd. Um, but the simple thing about the toss, I've got to jump forward to the mm. toss because the yep. story will take Black Opal's time out uh, completely. Um, but the interesting thing about the toss is that it was overcast. You'll remember this well. It was overcast. It was sort of humid. It had been raining the three days before. So it was a typical, nasty, headingly morning, which was, you had to bowl. I mean, even Ben Stokes would have had a bowl here on this occasion. And I remember uh, tossing the coin. He's called heads. It's come down heads. Nightmare. Lost the toss to the West Indies. And so Viv's just sort of nodding. So I said, okay, Viv, um, what do you want to do? And he looked at me and he said, oh, you don't mind, man. So I said, well, well, it is traditional, Viv, I'm sure you don't mind, but it's traditional in this country that if you win the toss, you go one way or the other. He said, man, I don't mind, what would you like to do? <laughs> I said, well, we'd like to have a bowl, thank you, Viv. Okay, man, you can bat. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the fun side of the story. That yeah. was pretty yeah. well as it happened. The rest of it is slightly embellished, but... Um, anyway, I don't like to talk about the match very much, because you, you actually got a few more runs than I did. Well, all right, okay. Let's go straight into this then. Right, glad you can join in here. In fact, glad you get a chance to answer the question first. We're going to do a little quiz, which is something actually um, I, I do with some mates of mine in Cape Town there in the year, where you pick the scorecard up and you look at the score and I'll go, number one got nine. Who was he? So glad. That's how it works. We go down the list. This is 1988, Headingley, fourth test of the series. It's not going well. 
Um, it's my 100th test match, by the way, which I was very grateful that Chris actually allowed me to play. because You've got to pick your mates. You've got to pick your mates. Exactly. You had to pick one, drop one, as I remember it. Yeah. But anyway, so I, I was hoping to celebrate. It didn't quite work yeah. out. So number one got nine. Who was number one? Glaston Small, you go first. Graham Gooch. Correct. Number two got 12. Oh, gee, number two, 80, 84. He won't get this. Graham Fowler? No. Christopher Cowdery? Bonus uh, question. Uh, Mr. Curtis. Tim Curtis, correct. 12. Number three got 16. Glaston Small. Gatting. Mm, Cowdery? Athy. Correct. Bill Athy, 16. Number four got 13. Glaston Small. D.A. Gower. Correct. Um, and how are you out? For, for, hang on, for a bonus, for a bonus point, <laughs> how out? Court? Court Gully, Ball no. Marshall. Uh, no, Gully, no. that means you might have found nearly the middle of the bat. It has to be, <laughs> <laughs> be Dujon. Uh, definitely Court Dujon, yeah, Court Dujon. Uh, Bowl Benjamin, very fine bowler. Number five, uh, Lamb. Sorry, I've, I've ruined that one. 64 retired uh, AJ Lamb. Number six, 38, Glass and Small. IT. A.T. Botham. Mm, no, before we get that, it's uh, Robin Smith. Uh, uh, just time to say a very good evening to Jason Roy. Jason, how are you? Evening, guys. How are you doing? Sorry, I've, I've jumped Hi, in. Uh, no, jumped no, no, in story. Uh, now, what you th I'll, I'll bring you up to speed, Jason. Um, we okay. are, because we have Christopher Cowdery, who once yeah. captained England, yes. as opposed to what most people allege, which is captained England once. Uh, <laughs> which is true. That's because another one of my lines. Yeah, I know, I'll pay you for it later. Because we've got him, we're playing a little game. Before we come back to talking about this all current, we're playing a little game, which is the 1988 England versus West Indies Test match at Headingley, which was the game that Chris captained with absolute aplomb. Um, <laughs> and we are going through the scorecard. And I'm giving you, or the team here, the contestants, the score, and you have to name the players. So we've got down England's 11 to numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is Robin Smith, who got 38. Number 7... And Jason, you don't have to join in. You can just sort of listen to this and just. Yeah, keep it I think I'm going to use it as a as a learning learning uh, learning call. I think because I know nothing about the uh, about that test match. Thank God! For, thank God for that. Let's just double check. Our knowledge is is appalling. Okay, Jason. Jason, how old were you in 1984, Jason? 88. <laughs> 88. <laughs> Nah, I wasn't even around yet, mate. Exactly. <laughs> right. I wasn't even. I wasn't even a thought. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's hold that thought. Right. Gladstone Small, number seven, got naught. It Botham. <sighs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, this. Is... I promise you, if he'd been playing, I wouldn't have been. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to have another Skipper, crack? Skipper have... Cowdery. Yeah. C.S. Cowdery. Uh, how out? Bold. LBW, oh. bold. Bold. LBW, uh, bold. He was bold. Playing through mid wicket, playing across a straight one. No, it was LBW, LBW Marshall for none. Playing uh, across a straight one. Playing across a straight one. Uh, next man in, got two. Number eight. We need a wicket keeper. Paul Danton. From Jason Boys County. Alex Stewart. Ah, <laughs> at number eight, never been. No, he was going to say. Before, before Stewie. Before, yeah, before Stewie, Henri Dutchman. Oh, Jack Richards. Jack Richards, Jack you Richards. got it. Uh, next man in at number nine, all rounder, got naught, caught dues on Bon Marshall. Oh. Derek Pringle. Very good. Yes. Next man in, Neil Foster, got eight. Final man, Graham Dilley, got eight as well. So, okay, we, enough of that game. Um, the key point about all that was that when I spoke to Chris earlier this afternoon, he said, I think I got more runs than you in that game. <laughs> Sadly, none of us got a lot of runs. <laughs> that is not quite true. <laughs> I, I thought my Norton five would be enough. <laughs> I am... Um, my 13 and, what was it, uh, two, just shaved it. Were you, caught, were you caught Dujon in both innings? Correct. And in fact, <laughs> if I tell the story, 
Uh, I said, was my home a test match? And I was invited when it rained. Sadly, it didn't rain long enough to save the game. But I was invited to the test match special box to speak to the great man, Brian Johnston. And John was in his usual form. I mean, I was a little bit sort of down, having not particularly played well. And he said, are there, are there any, any, any two words you'd like to, like to sort of have removed from your career? Like, 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 you know, like laid back or something like that? I said, no, 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 court du Jean. Get rid of court du Jean. Life will be so much better. <laughs> Right, enough of the slippery. Um, Jace. Yes. How are you, first of all? How's it going? Yeah, very well, thanks. Excited, actually. Um, chomping at the bit to join up with the lads. I'll join up with them tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. It feels a bit surreal that I'll be kind of playing some, some cricket again. But, yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite cool. Um, so, what have you been doing the last couple of weeks? I was actually at, so I've been at Surrey now. I'm netting with the guys there. Um, three or four times a week for the last kind of three weeks or so. So dusting off the cobwebs and kind of trying to find all my, all my kit that's struggled over the loft somewhere. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's been nice to get back, mate. Oh, good stuff. And how are you feeling? How's it going? How, are you feeling in good touch? I mean, are you looking forward to Yeah, weirdly, playing? weirdly, I actually, yep. uh, my first two, my first two net sessions, I, I, I was like, I needed underarms. It was that, it was like hard work. Um, mm -hmm. But then as soon as that kind of left, I haven't picked up, well, if any, bad habits, which is quite good. Um, I just kind of went in, had a bit of a hit and, and enjoyed it. So um, thankfully, I'm feeling OK. Um, we, we won't know until I start facing the big boys uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the training camp, but we'll see. Yeah, OK. Well, obviously, we hope that all goes incredibly well, uh, as normal. Uh, and did you, OK, how much did you manage to watch of the test match? Um, I watched a lot of the last day, yeah, um, which was actually quite exciting at, in part. And then um, watched a few of the lads bat a little bit, um, but bits and pieces with with a little one running around. It's kind of keeping my caught my one eye on it and one eye on her. Um, so, yeah, en enough of the test match to 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 be impressed by what was going on, really. And what was the most impressive thing? Was it? I mean, for instance, Jason Holder, the way he led the team, the way he managed to. Um, managed to sort of orchestrate things to get wickets the right time to keep aside in the game. Jermaine Blackwood, all these things that yeah, I think Jay, I think Jason Holder's six, but that that was watching him bowl there. I mean, he didn't mm. miss his lengths really. He was mm. he was just on the money. Um, and I watched his interview where he was talking about how he took a lot from uh, Glenn McGrath and the way he just. I mean, he, he mentioned himself in Glenn McGrath's category. I, I, mean, I think he's got a little bit of a way to go, but he's a similar sort of bowler where he just hits that mark over and over again. And yeah. It was an amazing interview, actually. Well, he's amazing. I think he's a very impressive man. And in fact, if yeah, you look at his figures over the last, say, 12 months or so, he is taking wickets at something like 15. Which wow, is, yeah. no, he's, he's, he's I, know, I know that's a limited time, but yeah, he's having a really good spell. It was the perfect conditions as well for the big guy, wasn't it, really? Um, so I think we, we were just, I think everyone talks about the first innings, but also kind of second innings, getting rolled like that was, it was tough, wasn't it? But we just needed another 40, 50 more to get that scoreboard pressure because yeah. even though it was a, well, say fourth day pitch, really, the chasing 200, it's not really like in your head. Whereas if it's 250, 260, it's... That's a horrible little total. Um, so yeah, it was. I'm looking forward to the next one. To be honest. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, right from your view as a current player in the current era. Yeah. What about this West Indies attack? Because I mean, our memories go back um, a bit further to the ones that we would always say, <clears throat> from our own experience, were the best in the world. Um, certainly at the time, maybe ever. I and mean, some great figures from the likes of Malcolm Marshall, Joel Garner, uh, Michael Holding, Andy Roberts, and the rest of them. What's the current feeling about the West Indies pace attack as it stands nowadays? Well, as it stands right now, I think the boys got a bit of a, bit of a shake up there. With, with, mm -hmm. uh, they all bowled extremely well. And I don't think the boys, not that they weren't expecting that. I think they all know how good they are. Mm -hmm. But you never know after three and a half months out how people are going to rock up. Um, so they have definitely got the capability, um, especially with Roach, Gabriel and Holder, to, to become legends. If not, Roach is, Roach is up there, isn't he? He's just a few incredible games away from that Hall of Fame stuff. Mm. 
I don't know, actually. I, I don't really know much about Roach's kind of stats, but I know that he's just been around for a long time. Because he burst yeah, on the scene. Wasn't, wasn't, he, wasn't he rapid when he first came on yeah. the scene? Yeah, he was. Like, he was quicker. He's become a better bowler, I think. Yeah. He okay. sacrificed, sacrificed a bit of pace. Um, right, his figures been. are good, but they... If you're brutal, they don't compare to the great men of the 80s. You know, they were all no, about no. You know, taking their probably. wickets at 20 to 22. Roach, I think, is probably 26, 27, 28, somewhere around that. So, I mean, the figures yeah. tell a story, but he's, yeah, I mean, I think he's still a very fine bowler. Glad, I mean, let's, let's, this is your department, Glad, so let's, let's ask you about this. I mean, what's impressive about Roach is, and yes, he, he, he seemed to have given up, given up the thought of being an out and out quickie. And mm. he's, he seems to have concentrated on, on, on what he has is he, he moved, is he, how he moves the ball, particularly to the left-handed batsman from around the wicket. I, yeah. mean, I mean, it's interesting. I saw some stats during the test match about how, how much he bowls around the wicket they are to, to left-handed batsmen. I mean, in my career, I, I would have bowled less than 1% of my deliveries around the wicket. It just wasn't a fashionable thing to do. I concentrated on the left-handed batsman like yourself, Gal. You know, yep. you've got you got two, you've got two you've got two options. You go across your body with the angle. Yep. And and then what I actually like to do, I would then get you falling over towards the offside and then bring it back in towards the, your pads and your stumps. So you you you're working on two, two options. Roach and 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 actually short and broadie, short our short broad. Mm. He's yeah, just a say phenomenal that. operator ball into left-handed batsmen from around the wicket and it's and, and it's a great modern modern way the, the modern way of bowling how they've they've utilized how, how they've utilized the how the the, the the it started from reverse swing i think that's where mm. that's where it all this bowling from around the wicket it started from when the ball was reverse swinging and now with the conventional swing these the, the, the modern day I was just thinking of flint off to Gilchrist, that sort of thing. Yeah. It was exactly I mean, the same principle. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I should just count myself lucky that, A, I didn't have to face you, Glad, bowling as you described there, because that would have been absolutely unplayable. You know, nipping it away, nipping it away, nipping it back. Thanks for <laughs> much. Job done. Um, I just don't remember it. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, the, the, yeah, I think you're right. I think the people have worked it out. Um, I mean, Stuart last year at Warner was an extraordinary sequence of dismissals wasn't it yeah i mean but also even for so as a right-handed batsman if the, if a left armor comes around the wicket mm -hmm. and so while riaz does this when the ball's reversing a bit he comes around the wicket like has a very low arm it comes in at middle middle and leg and it hits your off stump and you're like it's it's almost unplayable because in your eyes the ball's coming at a certain angle and you it's quite hard to adapt to to a completely different thing so when left armors come around the wicket and swing it away from right handers it's extremely tough yeah so that's a huge skill to have and, and Brody's against Warren last year was just the the pinnacle of that skill I think mm. I mean undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly if, if I was playing today um I would I would definitely bowl more around the wicket to left to left-handed back left-handed batsman absolutely but I I still I I would still like to operate from from over the wicket because you you still particularly someone like say Joffrey Archer, I think he he he's one for me. He should never bowl um, around the wicket because he bowls from so close to the stumps. Yeah, he's wicket to wicket. Yeah. So for me, he he's he's obviously got LBW in play. He can he, he tends to run it across them anywhere. So so for me, when he goes around the wicket, hmm. he's basically taking his LBW option out out out, out of out of play. Because he bowls from point. almost up, up, wicket to wicket, so I, I get a bit confused sometimes of why he goes around around the around the wicket to left-handed batsman. But that's that seems to be the modern the modern way of, way of yeah. bowling. Mm. Just keeps the batsman thinking as well. I think if your bowler is yeah. always going over the wicket, over the wicket, over the wicket, you're on 80, 90, and then all of a sudden he comes around the wicket. Some of you got to then adapt to. You change your game that far into your innings. It gets you thinking as a batsman. So. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess yeah. the thing, right, Chris, as a captain, and you're instructing, you know, these magic talents what to do next. Um, as a captain, if you had Joffre Archer in your, in your armory, in your lineup, you'd say, okay, right, start with what you do best, which I think, as Gladys said quite rightly, is wicket to wicket, 
threatening the stumps, threatening the head. I mean, he's got all these, I mean, some of those deliveries at the Aegeus Bowl were genuinely frightening, even from the sofa. Um, so you start from that, and only when you're getting a bit stuck do you say, well, let's just try something else. Yeah, that's interesting, that, because there are two things that came out of listening to you there. One was, um, I wonder how many times you were caught humpage bold small uh, in those years, <laughs> nicking outside off stump. Uh, the other thing is, though, that Archer, I agree with Glad, Archer's got the perfect action, beautifully close to the stumps, all that. He may struggle round the wicket. But it was for me, having seen how West Indies bowled, it was a perfect, perfect occasion for Stuart Broad. It was one of those pitches where, you know, he can bowl around the wicket, and mind you, only, only had one yeah. left handed, didn't they, I think. But, you know, he, he's, he would have pitched it up. And people like Gabriel, uh, Joseph to a certain extent, they all bowled a fuller length. They bowled better in those conditions, in our kind of conditions, than we did. And, you know, at Archer, but on Archer, I just think he's, he's got everything. I think all you say to him is just relax and bowl. And, yeah. and if it's not yeah. going your way, then okay. You start pinging a few in short. He's got that fantastic bouncer, hasn't he? Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, you've, you've kind of led me to the next topic, which is looking ahead to the second test match, which is imminent. Um, a decision on who plays in this game. I mean, a lot of people, including Stuart Broad himself, quite understandably, were confused bemused, miffed, upset, and all the rest of it by the fact that Stuart Broad, who'd done so well in South Africa, wasn't playing in that first test match. Uh, whatever reasons were given, you can understand some of the logic. So what are they going to do at the start of the second test, do you think? Well, if you're asking me, without any question, Broad has to play. Um, the others have had a pretty gruelling time. They've, they've bowled quite a lot of overs for their first outing of the year. So you've got to leave one of them out. I mean, Woody, he, he, he's got a bad injury record, so you wouldn't want to push him into two tests in, in two games, uh, in, in two weeks, uh, in my view. So he would be an obvious candidate. Jimmy, I thought, is looking really fit and well, so you'd play him. And, you know, you don't want to leave out Joffre on a pitch which historically has had a bit of pace and bounce in it. Even though Bumble says a very it's slow, it's been raining, he says. It's been raining and cold up here. Um, but, you know, I just think it's broad for the wood for me, and I haven't seen the pitch or the overhead conditions. If it's um, over a bowl first. Indeed. Jace, do, do you have a, a view on this? Not really, but I think it's always, it's always been a tough one for England selectors with, with someone like Wood and someone like Archer playing two 90-mile-an-hour-plus bowlers in the same team. It's quite a difficult thing to do. But I think with, with Brody, with him, bit, the reason he was so upset is because he completely expected to play. Um, which is absolutely fine. And he was definitely right to feel that way. Um, and then to get it taken away from you in the first game after three and a half months, my word, like, I'd be, it'd be fuming, wouldn't you? Um, but I think at the end of the day, they went with that decision just to try and, just try and blow them away. Um, so I don't know what they were. I don't, I don't have any. I can't really say, sit here and be like, drop this guy, <laughs> right. drop that guy. Um, I, I tell you what, but talking to Stuart, I thought the interview he gave was... Great. So um, good. Great yeah. TV. Yeah, I mean, because, um, I mean here's, here's, here's a word, Jace, quietly in your ear. What we hate are the anodyne, it's all about the team thing, you know, all the sort of stuff that you're told to say. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is good for team spirit, good for the sort of political element of it, good for the, you know, the whole thing. But, but what we'd love hearing is someone like Stuart on that day with a bit of passion. Yeah. And look, I'm bloody upset because... Just being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, it's so refreshing to see yeah. some honesty. And even though it's been three and a half months and everyone's grateful that sport's back on, people still have mm -hmm. feelings and emotions. So um, it was great TV and it's so good that he did do what he did. Mm. I think it, like Stokes, he touched on his interview, it'd be weird if he did it. <laughs> I mean, OK, there are probably other players, maybe younger players, maybe players that sort of start their career who would just toe the party line and say, well, we understand it's for the team, yeah. and you know, I hope you're getting soon enough. But, but I, I can tell you, because as you know, all of us who've you know, been and gone from the game itself and playing the game itself, you remember the passion, you remember the emotion. And you're also aware that I think when people are watching, you know, the fans, they love that emotion. And they love watching yeah. others, others against Donald, yeah. uh, that one-on-one -on -one confrontation. People look at that as brilliant sort of television, yeah. brilliant theatre. And then all the stuff that, you know, the, you know, the interviews bring to the game, all the understanding, all the insight. Um, in all honesty, if people just toe the party line and say, well, it's all about the team, you know, we get it's dull, we get bored. 
Um, and if, yeah. if someone wants to say something more interesting and be more passionate and more involved, suddenly we'll find ears are pricking up and you know, yeah. the levels of respect go up and yeah. the, the interest is peaked. Yeah, that's I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Anyway. As, as long as it's reasonable as well, though. You yeah, can't no, of be, oh, yeah, yeah. If, if you, didn't, if you yeah. didn't have the 12 months he's had, or, or even longer, yep. obviously, um, and he came out and he was a bit like that, then it would be a different taste in people's mouth. But yeah. Um, so yeah, okay. very good. Well, you think good. you think Joe Root will be there up in Manchester in his in the bubble in Manchester now, thinking, well, I've I've got a one of my best bowlers, one of England's highest wicket takers, who is itching. He's gonna be he's gonna be busting. Yeah, it. he always he always yeah. busts to get anywhere. But yeah. Broad, he's short Broad will be so revved up. You know, yeah. for, for this test match coming up. That, you know, I'll tell you what, Joe Root will know. I'll tell you what Joe Root will say. He'll sidle up to Broadie at about quarter past ten and he said, I'm really sorry, mate, what happened to Southampton. I would have picked you. <laughs> <laughs> Throw Stokesy under the bus. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> yeah. Right, um, gentlemen. We always encourage questions from those who are listening into us and always very grateful to have people listening into us. That is for sure. A um, couple to start with here. One um, from a guy called John Lister. John, good, uh, good evening to you. Who says this, in the first test, three batsmen were dismissed only for the decision to be overturned because of the bowler overstepping. Forget umpire's decision, it was all about overstepping. How many other no balls may have been bowled is anyone's guess? If an innings lasts for 100 overs, say, and six no balls are missed, then the batting side are denied six extra balls, each offering potential run scoring opportunities etc etc and that could be the difference between winning and losing therefore do we think as the panel that consideration should be given to the third or fourth umpire having responsibility for monitoring every ball to ensure that they're fair a sort of Wimbledon style beeper yeah. saying no ball would hate to be a third umpire oh god be, yes I mean unless <laughs> you have to pay attention oh. to every ball wouldn't you <laughs> yeah exactly oh, as as a bowler who was called once in a first-class game of cricket at, in Coventry, Warwickshire versus Middlesex in Coventry, mm -hmm. where I was called for 11 no balls in an over by a, a certain Australian... I refrain from 11 no balls? Because there's no such thing as an Australian gentleman. But he called me <laughs> 11, 11, <laughs> times, 11 times in an over. Bill Alley is. Now, you guys have heard who Bill Alley was. Eleven no ball. So, so I despair. I, I despair when I see when I see bowlers now mm. all in obvious no balls and it doesn't get called. I, I despair. Surely after glad. Surely after the second no ball, you thought take a run up back a bit, mate. <laughs> hey, Jay, <laughs> I, I did all of that. I, I brought. I took it back. I brought it <laughs> forward. I went. I, I went from an angle. Uh, I, I did. Oh, every, uh, I did everything. And I also, I also, for the last one, the last ball, well, for the second last, my penultimate ball, I came from two steps, made sure my <laughs> foot was nowhere near the crease and delivered this perfectly high action and the thing swung and it kept swinging and it didn't pitch on the cut surface. I bowled away. If you remember, I mean, I Bill, Alley, glad you remember Bill Alley was... Um, a great character, <laughs> um, huge. I mean, great. I mean, I, I remember him saying so many things he would say and do as an umpire, and also for the historians, he played for Somerset until into his fifties, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a long, long career. Yes. Made an awful lot of runs, took wickets. You know, real character in the game. And the the quote that was attributed to him, he said, "Well, I'm into the fifties now. I think I've had enough. My eyes and ears have gone, so I better take up umpiring." <laughs> 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 but the, 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 the senior player at Warwickshire was Dennis Samus, Dale Amos, scored up the bombs. And afterwards, I was distraught. I mean, I, I was knackered for one, and as well as distraught. <laughs> and he came when he came in the hut and he says, "Well, Gladdy, I know we, I know we wanted three good overs, but we didn't want them all at once." <laughs> <laughs> I, to, answer, anyway. to answer the question, to answer the question, yes. no, I think, yeah. I think, why not? I think if the technology's there, uh, let's 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 use it. I think the no balls now. There's not ever really a huge like it shouldn't really be an excuse for a no ball, but three and a half months out, there's going to be some teething from the yeah. big fellas as well. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, if the technology's there, I, th I, I think mean, it's I, pretty factual technology as well. You're not guessing. Yeah, you can do. I mean, the thing that always strikes me whenever this topic comes up, though, is that bowlers always seem to be pressing that line. 
And we know they do it in practice. They go, you know, a foot, foot and a half over the line as if it doesn't matter. And each and every time, more to the point, much more important to me is each and every time someone oversteps, whether it be by an inch, knowing full well that technology will look at this, whether it's half an inch, an inch, six inches, and each ball that takes a wicket, Ben Stokes, who did that, his first ever potential wicket in test cricket was disallowed. He did it again, but <laughs> brilliantly managed to get the wicket, the following ball at the Aegeus Bowl. But each time that happens, I just sort of, I just, I despair almost. You know, I think, well, you, why would you risk that as a bowler? Glad? Yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, now listen, yes. I mean, some people might say that obviously the margins are so the, so fine that you're operating to. And so, I mean, the, the, the front foot rule is one that obviously it was, I mean, if you go yeah. back in time, it mm. used to be back, it used to be a back foot. That was, was, the, was, the, was the one that they watched for. And then obviously we knew, we knew that it was then guys, the guys would drag that, that back foot to, you know, two, two, three feet. Someone like Fred, or Fred Truman, say for instance. And then the foot was, was be delivering the ball from probably 20 yards. Rather than, yeah. But so the front foot rule was brought in. Some, some people might argue, is it time to have a look at, re look at that rule? But yes, listen, the bowlers, they're, 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 they're nowhere they should place their, their, their feet. And but what, the interesting thing I know from from a, my perspective, and it's it's a hard thing to do when you practice. When you practice, you look at any bowler the day before the test match, the morning of the test match. I would I would put I would bet a pound that all of them would overstep that mark yep. in practice. Um, yet yet you go into a match situation, you know you can't do that. So that's how they practice, and it's very yeah. Yeah. it's very hard. It's a very hard thing not to pull to pull yourself back. Yeah, okay, right. My final word on this is two things. One is the back foot rule, which Richie Benno, the great man himself, always favoured for some reason. I think, as you say, allowed too much leeway for those that dragged. Front foot is very straightforward. There's a line, hit it. You, it cannot get any simpler than that. And if you're worried about it, even if you've already bowled nine no balls in the overglad, you just try and get back there. So anyway, let's can leave I, that. Can I just make one quick point yep. on that? Yep. Um, my take on it is if you can get um, the third umpire or somebody else, whoever it is, to make these calls, take the, take the pressure off the umpires to call no balls, I think there should be a bleep that goes up and, and yep. that is no ball. Because Jason mentioned if England had got 240 ahead and West Indies would have got very close to it, might have even lost the game, there might have been, we might have bowled 10 no balls that weren't called. Where are those 10 runs? Yeah, sure. So you sort of feel every no ball well, should... No, that's fair, that's fair. And that's John Lister's point. That's John's point. You know, they are, you know, the whole thing in the end, if it's, if it's close, it becomes crucial. No, that's just a perfectly fair point to make. Okay. Yes, Thank you, John. Make one more point to it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, go on. The, the line, the line on the bat increase, yep. you know, when the batsman, they're allowed to bat, whereas you see some of the batsmen even batting a half, you know, six inches a foot out of their crease. So, so, so batters get a bit of leeway from where they can stand, but the bowlers don't. That's because the bowlers bowl is too slow. They need saying, to get closer. <laughs> I'm going to say, the I, I need to test themselves. That's why they're batting out their crews. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm on your side there. And we're glad, obviously, that gin and tonics already started to take effect. <laughs> that, was a very, that, was a, that was a very bowler comment. I like yeah, it. Jace, uh, Jace, quick, are you all right for time? Are you. You got Absolutely things? fine. You're no, okay. I'm great. Right, okay. Another question yeah. here from Tony Chanmugam, who says, is the main priority to win test matches or prepare for the Ashes? Because there's a bit of talk about that in terms of that team selection for the Aegeus Bowl. Um, if the main priority is to win matches and therefore the World Test Championship, then why aren't we picking the best side to win the match? Which... Well, I, I, I'll jump, yeah, I, I, think, I think they are trying. I think they thought they picked the best side to win that test match. Yeah, um, without a doubt, and every Test match matters because it's a Test championship, and because it's professional sport, and each individual wears their heart on their sleeve, especially when they're representing England. So it doesn't matter who you're playing against, in front of no crowd or in front of a hundred thousand. Each ball, each match, each session is just as important as the next. So, and I think they did think that they picked. Well, I, who's to say they didn't? They just needed a few more runs, and we we could have won that Test match. So. Fine margins, like Glad said previously, but yeah. 
So yeah, yeah. I, agree, I agree with that. Um, mm. they, they, yeah. they picked the side they thought was going to win. They picked the best side in their view. Where I yeah. think they are going to look ahead, possibly, is when they've got this decision tomorrow, who yeah. to drop or leave out for Joe Root. Uh, Root, he'll obviously come back in the side. And I think then if it comes down to Denley and Crawley, which it might, one is 22 or whatever he is and the other's 34. They've um, already decided that, haven't they? Oh, they have they? Uh, I didn't know that. But, I don't know. Uh, have they? I, I might have read something different. It might have just been rubbish. But <laughs> I thought I saw on Twitter that um, Crawley's gone. staying where he is. What, and Joe, right? Joe's been left out? Yeah, Denley yeah. three, Root four. Okay. Know. All right. Well, there we are. So that, you know, two good players, but they've, they've picked the young one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Well, like, I mean, I, again, sorry, I'm equally unaware of what's, um, what's true or not here. I mean, Twitter, of course, is the font of all truth. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Jace, but before you joined us, we were discussing Chris's problems with Twitter, which has been spreading stories about his captaincy and Viv Richards and all the rest of it, which have grown, uh, the, the proportion of untruth to truth has grown from about 50-50 to about 80-20 at the moment. So... <laughs> um, I think the safe way to look at this one is to wait until tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll have to check the papers as we come off this, but anyway, we'll look at, the, look at the screens tomorrow morning as the game starts and see who's actually named. Yeah. I, mean, I would obviously pick Crawley. Um, yeah, but I see, what you, I see your point there, Chris, as well, about the future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, well, it's, it's, it's when, when you've got a situation where, I mean, Joe Denley has looked perfectly good, but hasn't made big scores. Um, therefore... He's had enough chances, 14, 15 games now, wherever it might be, uh, to put a big score on the, uh, on the scoreboard. Uh, Zach, I thought, looked very good. Uh, I'm not saying this just because he's got black opal on the back of his bat. Um, but there again, <laughs> he has got black opal on the back of his bat. <laughs> and the Lord's tablets on his grip. <laughs> and the Lord's tablets. So, you know, we are ticking off the boxes. In fact, the sad thing is that both uh, Zach and Joe Denley are potentially raising money for Lord's tablets for every run that they yes. scored the best series. So um, how about just saying to Joe Root, look, Joe, you, you must be exhausted after the birth. Um, you know, have another game off. <laughs> do them. Give him another chance. No, sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> you know, just getting into the realms of very, very facetious stuff. The, the issue there, though, the issue mm. there was if, if Crawley had made the 30 and Denley had made the 75 at Southampton, uh, mm. what might have happened? And I think they would have gone for Zach Crawley, the younger guy. And, and OK, he's got massive potential. But that would have been more of a, a, an interesting choice, a decision, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I love that. Like, that's the first time, really, I've watched Zach bat for a, for a period. And I was so impressed. He, he yeah. took it to the off spinner. He played his shots. I was, yeah, he, he's, he was class there, yeah. So um, it's a big decision to make, isn't it? But Something was, that would impress you, Jason. Yeah, I loved it. Somebody it, playing the shot. Rostin, he was, he was bowling off spin and everyone was just side padding and he came in and ran down, bopped him over mid-on. I was like, yes. That's, <laughs> that's better. I love it. Well, it's, it's, it's lovely when it works. That is absolutely <laughs> true. Um, Jace, as we got you here, uh, yes. other questions coming in. And there's one here um, from, it says, Anonymous Attendee, which is a lovely name to have. Um, hello, Jace. It's your biggest fan's birthday. Um, Name of Polara, um, it would mean the world to her if you'd wish her a happy birthday. So her name's Polara. Yes, I've, I've, I've met her before. She's a, she's a lovely lady um, out, in, out in Sri Lanka. Um, so a huge happy, happy birthday. Sorry I haven't got around to saying anything on social media, but thank you for your support continuously. Um, I really appreciate it. So happy birthday. Um, hope you've had a lovely day. Do you know, you, you must have a lot of fans in Sri Lanka, as must Black Oval, because of the four questions I've got on the screen, two of them are relating to Pilar and her, and her birthday. So uh, let's forget the test match. Let's just talk, you know, let's just sing happy birthday, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> now, other stuff. We've got a fellow called Rowan Hander. Rowan is 12 years old from Whitney Cricket Club. Um, he's a spinner and an all-rounder. And he wants to know, how long before England give Amma Verdi from Jason's County? Uh, sorry, a chance. I suppose with Don Bess actually performing very well in that first test match, uh, and we will have to wait, but he's, he's on the way up, isn't he? He is on the way up. He's constantly striving to be better and better. Every net session, he's wanting to learn something new, whether he's got a white ball in his hand or red ball in mm -hmm. his hand. Um, 
he's a very promising young talent, and he's showed that in the in, in the county championship over and over again, really. So, mm. yeah, it's it's hard when someone's performing and there's other spinners around that are performing just as well to put a to put a time limit on a certain individual is borderline impossible. Um, he's just got to wait patiently and, and then make the most of it when he gets his chance. Um, well, I mean, the, the great thing, of course, as we all know, is if you are in the team to try and put the performances in that keep you in the team, once you've done that, yeah. you, however good the competition, I mean, every now and again, of course, you might get, I suppose, conditions where two spinners could play but if you had two, you'd probably want one off spinner, one slow left armor. So, for instance, Jack Leach might get his chance back that way. And you've got, yeah, you know, it's only a year ago that Jack was a cult figure. <laughs> Obviously, you know, forgetting his one in that partnership at Headingley. But, yeah, you know, there are various ways of staying in the team. Um, when, how, how good is Amabody, do you think? It's hard to, yeah. yeah. I, trying to, it's quite hard to kind of explain. Um, hmm. But he's very, he's very naturally talented at spin bowling. But I think he's, he wants to, he knows that he's got a bit to learn. Um, like, like all young cricketers, even old cricketers, <laughs> you're always learning. But I think, yeah, yes, he is very good. Um, and he's, he's, he will get his chance. But I, that's, a, that's a very tough question. Mm. Can, I, can I say, uh, with regard to Don Bess, I mean, I'm, I am... When I first saw him ball in the Test match, I think he was first picked at Lords mm -hmm. a couple of years ago against, against Pakistan. He was picked against. I, I mean, I, I did one. I, I did, you know, what is happening here? Is this a, is this the best spinner that we've yeah. got in, in in England? But um, I, I, I like what I, what I like. I like his attitude. He's he's you know for particularly for a finger spinner. And you know just someone like like Jason. Jason Roy would be licking. You see a finger spinner, he'd be licking his lips when you see a finger spinner coming on the ball. So he, he's got he's got a, he's got a good attitude. He's a bit jaunty. He's got a bit of bit of swagger about him, and and yeah. and he's got some good control. I, 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 he's got some really good control and how he bowls. And so I, I think he's improved. He's improved. But he can, yeah. two, two, and that's the other years. thing as well. In, in the modern game as well, to be just a bowler, you have to be an incredible bowler. Mm -hmm. So Dom offers it with a stick and he's a decent fielder. So he's, he's very handy. Um, so something like Verds needs to work on, he knows it as well, is his batting and his fielding. And until, and I mean, every, every player, especially on a one-day side, Bats, fields, bowl, like are very good. Apart from I don't really bowl that much, but I could. But we don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, let, let me just like remind you. Let me remind you. <laughs> let me remind you of Phil Tufnell, <laughs> who could not bat, but most of his career couldn't catch. <laughs> Eventually, took a steepling catch at Bridgetown in Barbados at a crucial moment, <laughs> which should go down in history as one of the most incredible things. I mean, Monty, the dear old Monty as well. I mean, let's face Monty, all these people, you know, had to learn. Um, you know, they had the talent in the fingers, spin was fine, yeah. and the, but they had to learn to do other things. Um, and it's, I, mean, I think you're right. I think Dom has actually come on a lot in the last couple of years. I think his bowling is infinitely better than it was when he first played. Um, and yeah, and spinners, of course, Chris, you know, spinners take time or can take time because they have potentially longer in the game to acquire all the arts. I mean, we went to India with Phil Edmonds and Pat Pocock. Pat, I think, was, what, 38 years old that year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, it's interesting that because spinners, Derek Underwood always used to say that a spinner's, he should really be 30. He hasn't mm -hmm. really learned his trade till he's 30. And now, obviously, that's come down a bit. But still, I reckon these spinners have got year. They've got a bowl for years to really reach their peak, and probably 27, 28 would be about right. But those two bowlers were great in India. I mean, Pocock and Edmonds together, they were terrific. Okay. Um, I'm just seeing. By the way, just to talking talking about what we were <laughs> the topic we were on just now. Again, according to anonymous attendee. Um, I'm not sure whether to believe this. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to sound dubious, but it says ECC website. Is that meant to be ECB website? Uh, suggests the national selectors have made three changes to the squad. Lancashire Seaver James Anderson and Durham Quick Mark Wood are both rested. 
Sam Curran is added to the squad alongside Sussex Seema Ollie Robinson. Is this mm. what? Um, we need to get some facts here. If, if, if well, that no, is... I'm, I'm hoping it's a fact. Um, England captain Joe Root returns to the squad. Yes, we know that. Joe Denley missing out. So that's fascinating. Jimmy Anderson missing out at Old Trafford, if that is confirmed tomorrow morning. That is fascinating. That's that was the same on BBC. That was, a BB, that was on the BBC. That's, yeah, it says Anderson and Wood. Um, and I think Old Trafford, as we know, it's a bit, it's probably the, it's probably the, probably the quickest pitch in, in England, I would say. Was it Jason, Old Trafford? Yeah, it is. But it, also, I mean, if it's been raining and it's been a bit overcast and stuff, it'll, it'll, it'll hoop. Yeah. Well, be, then you've got then you, you have still got bowlers obviously that all swing the ball so I, I, yeah that that's a, that is quite a surprise but <laughs> yeah um, I mean sorry forgive me anonymous attendee um, for casting doubt it just seemed just seemed it just I just took me by surprise and I apologise yeah. for the lack of um, well for not looking at the BBC Sport website or even the Sky Sport website uh, ahead of this hour but if that's we'll, we'll see what happens in the morning obviously um, but that appears to be the way it's going. Um, we are close to the end of our time again here tonight. Um, so, gentlemen, one and all, how optimistic are we that this test match will see England come back with a bounce? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, without, without doubt on my part. Sorry for just jumping in there, but I've got no <laughs> doubt that the boys will be fired up now. Um, they'll have that, luckily, they've had no time to lick their wounds. They won't get too down about it, but they were just shocked I think at how well West Indies performed there now they're just going to have to just up their game and I think they will England have always been very good at kind of replying so um, it's going to be an exciting one I think but I think 100% speaking to a few of the lads they're fired up yeah cool cool glad glad as that man as we said at the start of the show the man with a sort of foot in various camps including Barbados West Indies England and the counties and all the rest of it and um, where do you stand on this <laughs> Well, obviously, it's a big, it's a big plus for England that the captain Joe Root and best batsman bat is back in the lineup, so that strengthens our batting. Um, but um, the ball in Jimmy Anderson not 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 playing omitted, so Broad comes in. I think that's another big plus yeah. for Joe Root. Yeah. So, but it's I think was it 1988? It was a uh, was a uh, was uh, was uh, the West Indies haven't won a, a full Test series in England. Since since the Christopher Cowdery's team in, in 1988. so I'm You're sure blaming me again. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I just point out? Can I just defend my great friend here? In as much as that series in '88 had Mike Gatting as captain, had John, um, Embry? John Embry as captain, had Christopher Cowdery as captain, did you captain? Graham Gooch as captain, had Derek Pringle as captain when Graham Gooch left the field at the Oval. I think he was in the final <laughs> Test match. In fact, anyone in, who had a British passport that year who didn't captain England was entitled to be rather upset. And we could have rather sort of spread the blame. So, I mean, I'm, don't, don't blame Chris alone. I mean, he did his best well, for that one well, game at Hiddingley. Well, my, my point is, is that, you know, the way, and uh, brilliantly led by Holder, Jason Holder, he looks an impressive character. He obviously has the, this team with him. And I believe he's been speaking to various Caribbean prime ministers of... of, of Called him up during the week to to give him his clear congratulations. So he's been buoyed by the support in the Caribbean. So I think there's there's sense in history this West Indies team. But I expect I expect England to fight back strongly here right. at Old Trafford this week. Right, Christopher Cowdery, who once captain in England, the final verdict from you. Final verdict is I agree with the boys. England should bounce back and. Don't forget, we were very, very strong favourites before the first game. Didn't go for us. But I just worry about the toss. <laughs> overcast, overcast tomorrow morning gives West Indies that one little bit of chance. Don't bat first. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, I must set the alarm for the toss. Make sure I don't miss, don't miss the toss tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, gentlemen, Chris, Gladys, Jason, um, many, many thanks again for... Your attendance tonight, Chris. Nice to have you with us the first time. Jason, no doubt we'll see you again. Jason, we'll yeah. wish you well for everything you've got to do in the next few weeks as well. We'll uh, obviously keep in touch and um, hope to have you back on as soon as we can. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, you know, good luck with that. Glad go and finish off. Go and pour yourself another gin and tonic. Um, and all of you who've been watching here tonight, uh, supporting Black Opal and the Lord's Taverners, thank you very much indeed for your presence. We'll see you next time. <laughs>